Most people don't think of chickens as particularly intelligent. But did you know that chickens can be trained to do tricks like a dog and can even discriminate different colors by name? Yellow? If this seems unexpected to you, then what scientists have discovered about chicken intelligence might really surprise you. I'm Dr. Mickey Pardo, and I'm a biologist specializing in animal intelligence and how animals communicate with one another. I got my bachelor's degree in environmental biology from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. I got my PhD in animal behavior from Cornell University, and I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at Colorado State University. I've studied animals as diverse as squirrels, woodpeckers, and elephants, and I have well over a decade of experience conducting and publishing original scientific research on animal cognition and communication. In this video, I'm going to walk you through some of the scientific studies that have been done on the mental capacities of chickens, challenge the common misconception that chickens are simple and unintelligent creatures, and talk about why I think this matters in terms of how we treat them. In 2005, researchers demonstrated that chickens are capable of self-control. The researchers gave chickens the option between pecking one key and getting three seconds of access to food after a two-second delay, or pecking a different key and getting 22 seconds of access to food after a six-second delay. So the second option required the chickens to wait three times as long, but gave them a much bigger payout if they were capable of delaying gratification. And in all cases, the chickens chose the second option, indicating that they were capable of controlling their impulses and waiting longer to get a bigger reward. Now, waiting six seconds may not seem like much, but it's actually a much bigger deal than you might think. Self-control is generally considered a relatively advanced cognitive ability, and some psychologists believe that it's associated with the development of self-awareness and the ability to plan for the future. And just to give you some perspective on the chicken's abilities, another study offered three and a half to five-year-old human children a similar choice. They could either have one sticker right now, or they could wait 30 seconds and get three stickers. And unlike the chickens, the children chose the first option. They were apparently incapable of delaying gratification in order to get a bigger reward. Now we can't necessarily compare these two studies directly because the experimental paradigms were very different. The chickens had to wait just six seconds, whereas the children had to wait 30 seconds, and the relative values of the rewards as perceived by the chickens and the children might not have been equivalent. But it does provide some context for what the chickens are capable of. Speaking of comparing chickens to humans, young chicks actually display more advanced mathematical abilities in some respects than young human children. In one study, researchers presented chicks with a line of 10 identical covered holes with food placed in only one hole at a particular position within the line. Some chicks always had food placed in the third hole, some always had food placed in the fourth hole, and some always had food placed in the sixth hole. Because the holes all looked the same, the only way that the chicks would be able to learn which hole contained the food is if they could effectively count the holes. And after some training, the chicks would immediately go for the correct number hole, even when the apparatus was rotated by 90 degrees. That indicates that they were capable of understanding the ranked order of numbers within a sequence, which is the fundamental basis of counting. By contrast, a study on human babies found that they didn't even develop the concept of greater than versus less than until sometime between the ages of 9 and 11 months. But not only can chicks identify a numerical position within a sequence, they can also perform basic arithmetic. To show this, researchers first allowed chicks to imprint on a red ball, which basically means that the chicks formed an attachment to the ball in the same way that they would normally form an attachment to their mother. Previous experiments had shown that chicks who imprinted on a red ball would want to be near as many red balls as possible. Then, the researchers let the chicks watch as the researchers placed different numbers of red balls behind two opaque screens. The chicks could see the balls going behind the screens, but they couldn't see the balls once they were behind the screen. Finally, 
The researchers moved some balls from one screen to the other in view of the chicks, and then let the chicks decide which screen to walk to. And regardless of how many balls a screen had started with, the chicks were significantly more likely to choose the screen that ended up with the most balls. For example, if the researchers started with five balls behind the left-hand screen and none behind the right, and then moved three balls from the left-hand screen to the right-hand screen, the chicks would choose the right-hand screen. And if they only moved two out of five balls from the left screen to the right screen, the chicks would choose the left screen. If they started with four balls behind the left-hand screen and one ball behind the right, and then moved two balls from the left-hand screen to the right-hand screen, the chicks would choose the right screen. This showed that not only can chicks remember the position of objects that are out of sight, but they can perform addition and subtraction in their head with numbers at least as big as five. For comparison, 12 to 14 month old human children failed to understand addition and subtraction with numbers any higher than three. But arguably, the most impressive mental abilities of chickens are in the realm of social behavior, which makes sense because chickens are highly social birds. Like many social animals, chickens can learn from one another. For example, hens who got to watch a trained hen pecking a specific key to get food were significantly more likely to peck the correct key themselves than hens who watched an untrained hen or no one at all. But not only do chickens learn by passively watching one another, they also go out of their way to actively teach their babies. In another experiment, researchers fed mother hens two batches of the same kind of food, with each batch dyed a different color. One of the batches was sprayed with quinine to make it taste bad, so the hens would learn that one color food was palatable while the other was not. Then, the researchers let the hens watch as their chicks were fed food of both colors. Now in reality, none of the chicks' food had been sprayed with quinine, so the chicks would happily eat both colors. But the mother hens didn't know that. And when the hens saw their chicks eating the wrong color food, they pecked at their own food significantly more than when they saw their chicks eating the right color food, but they didn't actually swallow the food themselves. In other words, the increased pecking was just for the benefit of the chicks to teach them which color food was palatable. Mother hens have also been shown to respond to their chicks' distress in a way that's consistent with feeling empathy. Researchers put mother hens and their chicks in separate boxes side by side with a clear screen between them. Then they sprayed the chicks with a puff of compressed air, which is an unpleasant stimulus. And when the mothers saw their chicks being sprayed with compressed air, they spent significantly more time standing alert and significantly less time preening than when the compressed air was directed off to the side. These behaviors are associated with agitation and are the same behaviors that the mothers exhibited when they were sprayed with compressed air themselves. Furthermore, when the mothers saw their chicks being sprayed with compressed air, their heart rates went up, but this didn't happen when the mothers were sprayed with compressed air themselves. The researchers concluded from these results that the hens experienced an emotional response to seeing their chicks in distress, which is a key component of empathy. Chickens also have a remarkably complex system of communication. Roosters produce alarm calls to warn their flock mates when there's a predator nearby, and they produce different alarm calls in response to aerial predators like hawks and ground predators like foxes. When researchers played back these calls to hens, the hens responded differently to the, to the two call types. In response to aerial alarm calls, they were more likely to immediately run for cover, crouch down, or look up at the sky, which is the appropriate response to a predator attacking from the air. But in response to ground alarm calls, they were more likely to stand up tall and scan from side to side, which is the appropriate response to a predator attacking on the ground. Roosters also take into account who's listening when they give these alarm calls. In one study, they were significantly more likely to produce an alarm call when in the presence of another chicken than when by themselves or in the presence of a quail, which is a different species. Roosters also mitigate the risk of their calling behavior by adjusting the length of the call. Longer calls are presumably more likely to be heard by the hens, but they also make it easier for a predator to locate the rooster who's calling. And roosters made longer calls when they were closer to a shelter, which indicates that they took risk into account in their calling behavior. 
Roosters also make food calls along with a little dance called a tidbitting display to let their hens know when they found a bit of food. <laughs> hens respond to these displays by coming over to investigate, but it's not just an automatic response to a stimulus. Instead, the evidence suggests that the hens actually understand that these calls refer to food specifically. In a 2007 study, researchers played back food calls to hens, and the hens looked down at the ground as if searching for food. But when the researchers dropped three kernels of corn on the ground and then played the food calls after the hen had already found the food, the hens did not search the ground. Since the hens were only given three kernels of corn, it wasn't that they simply weren't hungry anymore. Instead, the most logical explanation is that the hens assumed that the food call referred to the food they had just found and therefore didn't bother searching for it again. Just like with alarm calls, roosters take into account who's listening when they produce tidbitting displays. Hens prefer to mate with roosters who provide them with more food, so dominant roosters will attack subordinate roosters who make food calls in the presence of their hens. Subordinate males know this, so when the dominant male is paying attention, they give the dance component of the tidbitting display silently, but when the dominant male is not paying attention, they add the food call back in as well. Sometimes, a rooster may produce a food call when there is no food to get his hens to come back to him if they're straying too far away to where he can't prevent other males from mating with them. Whether the roosters actually understand that they're deceiving the hens is difficult to determine, and as far as I know, nobody's designed any experiments to try to test this. But regardless of the rooster's intent, the hens can certainly learn which males are trustworthy and which are more likely to give false food calls. In a 2016 study, researchers placed roosters and hens in adjacent cages and gave the male food so he would make a tidbitting display. To make some of the males seem more reliable to the females, the researchers fed the female whenever the male made a tidbitting display. And to make other males seem unreliable to the females, the researchers didn't feed the female whenever the male made a tidbitting display. Then, they put the hen in a separate room and played her a life-size live stream video of a male that she had come to see as reliable or a male that she had come to see as unreliable. Females looked significantly longer at the screen in response to video of a male that they had come to see as reliable, which indicates that hens can recognize individual roosters from a video display, can learn which roosters are reliable food callers and which are not, and pay more attention to roosters that they've come to see as reliable. Just like cats and dogs, chickens have individual personalities. I just got home from work. And this is all she wants to do. We just, yes, I'm, I, I physically can't, I can't come any closer physically with this happy face. Yeah, okay. Scientifically speaking, a personality is a unique collection of behavioral and emotional traits that someone exhibits consistently. In humans, our personality has a huge impact over many aspects of our lives, including our social status, and the same is true of chickens. In a 2014 study, researchers categorized the personalities of 50 roosters by measuring their activity level, how explorative they were, how often they crowed, how vigilant they were in general, and how vigilant they were after being startled. They also categorized the social dominance of each rooster by putting him together with another male and seeing if he won or lost the encounter. They found that roosters who were more explorative and more vigilant after being startled were also significantly more likely to be socially dominant, which indicates that personality can affect social status in roosters. What I've touched on in this video is just a small sample of the research that's been conducted on chicken intelligence and communication. But there's a big disconnect between what we know about how complex and intelligent chickens are and how they're treated by the meat and egg industries. Almost all chickens start their lives in a commercial hatchery. About half the chicks that hatch are male, but males don't lay eggs, and the breed of chickens raised for egg production doesn't grow fast enough to be profitably raised for meat. So the males are killed immediately after hatching by being ground up alive in a machine called a macerator, gassed to death with carbon dioxide, or simply stuffed into plastic garbage bags and left to slowly suffocate. The females who will be raised for their eggs typically have the tip of their beak cut off to prevent them from pecking one another to death out of the stress caused by extreme confinement. 
The tip of a chicken's beak is filled with sensitive nerve endings, but the chicks do not receive any painkillers during or after this painful procedure. About 80% of layer hens worldwide spend their entire lives in battery cages, usually with several birds crammed into a single cage. In the United States, the average battery caged hen has 67 square inches of space in which to live her entire life, which is smaller than a single 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. Even in places where battery cages have theoretically been banned, like the European Union, there are loopholes built into the law that allow farmers to get away with keeping hens in cages so small that they can't even spread their wings. Hens living in these conditions often develop open wounds and staph infections on their feet, which is caused by standing on filthy wire mesh for their entire lives. And to make matters even worse, domestic chickens have been bred to produce about 250 to 300 eggs in a single year, compared to their wild ancestor, which only evolved to produce 10 to 15 eggs in a single year. This high level of egg production depletes the chicken's calcium levels, which often leads to osteoporosis and broken bones. How often do their bones break? Every time I've dug one, they're broken. Yeah? Yeah, every single time. Ah! Ah! Stop your wings and I'll break your other leg. Chickens raised for meat are kept in overcrowded sheds, typically with no access to the outdoors. The sheds are usually not cleaned at all until the chickens are removed to be slaughtered, so that means that the chickens spend their entire lives in a space with such high levels of ammonia that it can burn their eyes, skin, and respiratory tract. Because they're bred to grow so quickly, their legs often can't support their body weight, and many chickens die of heart attacks before even being slaughtered because their hearts simply can't keep up with their unnaturally rapid growth rate. Some chickens fall on their backs and can't get up again due to their weight, which leaves them to slowly die of dehydration and starvation. Now, a lot of well-meaning people buy cage-free, free-range, or organic eggs and meat because they believe that these labels mean that the chickens were treated well. But unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. Cage-free chickens are kept packed into overcrowded sheds, and farmers are not required to give them any access to the outdoors in order to qualify for the cage-free certification. Free-range chickens are theoretically required to have access to the outdoors for at least half their lifetime. But in practice, the overcrowded conditions and small size of the access door mean that only about 10% of the chickens are outside at any given time on average, and many of the chickens will never get to go outside at all during their short lives. And regardless of whatever so-called humane certification they come with, all chickens raised commercially for eggs or meat are killed at a tiny fraction of their natural lifespan. The chickens are transported from the farm to the slaughterhouse by truck, a journey that often lasts several hours in all weather conditions with no food, water, or climate control. Because workers are required to load so many birds onto trucks in a short period of time, they often grab chickens by their legs and wings and roughly stuff them into crates, which causes many of the chickens to suffer from broken bones before they even reach the slaughterhouse. The most common method of slaughter is to hang the chickens upside down by their ankles while they're still fully conscious and drag them through an electrified water bath, which is supposed to stun them. Then their throats are slit and they're submerged in scalding hot water to remove their feathers. Being shackled upside down like this is very stressful and causes a lot of suffering for the chickens, even when it works as intended. But because the slaughter lines move so quickly, mistakes often occur. Multiple studies have demonstrated that electrical water baths often fail to render chickens unconscious. And according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in the U.S. alone, hundreds of thousands of chickens every year miss the blade and are boiled alive in the defeathering tanks. Again, it doesn't matter if the chickens are cage-free, free-range, organic, pasture-raised, or certified humane. They're all subjected to this ordeal of extreme suffering at the end of their lives. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, in 2020, about 70 billion chickens were killed for meat. It's hard to comprehend numbers that big, but to give you a sense of scale, if you took 70 billion staples and lined them up end to end, they would go all the way around the circumference of the earth about 17 and a half times. That's the number of chickens killed for meat in just one year, and that's not including billions more that are killed every year by the egg industry. To me, the greatest tragedy in this is that each one of these chickens is an individual. An individual who can exercise self-control, 
outperform young human children in mathematical reasoning, learn from and teach others, feel complex emotions like empathy, engage in sophisticated forms of communication and social behavior, and so much more. In other words, they're every bit as complex and capable of suffering as the dogs and cats that we love and treat as family. So why am I telling you all of this depressing information? Well, knowing what I know about the intelligence and emotional complexity of chickens and other farmed animals, I find it heartbreaking and unacceptable that we continue to exploit them in such horrific ways, and I want things to change. And the only way to change this status quo is if those of us who care about animals and care about what's right work together to create a better future. I'm not here to tell anyone what to do, and the last thing I want to do is to come across as preachy. But there's no getting around the fact that one of the most important things that any individual person can do to fight injustice is to stop supporting it as a consumer. The fewer people who buy meat, eggs, and other animal products, the less demand there will be for these products, and the fewer animals will be bred into a lifetime of misery. I know that most of you really don't want to stop eating meat, and I don't blame you at all. I really didn't want to stop eating it either. In all honesty, I'm a foodie at heart, and I always loved the taste of meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. But eventually, I realized that it didn't make any sense for me to claim to care about animals while actively harming them just because they taste good. I've now been eating a completely plant-based diet for nearly 14 years, and I've been pleasantly surprised at how much it opened my eyes to a whole world of delicious foods that I had never even tried before. I know that lifestyle change can be really hard, but it's a lot easier if you have the proper support. So if you decide that you want to stop contributing to the suffering of chickens and other animals, I've included some links in the description to help you out. Challenge 22 is a 22 day challenge which hooks you up with other people who are trying the same challenge as well as clinical dietitians who can help you through that initial transition. And if you're concerned about how to meet your nutritional needs on a plant-based diet, how to find food that actually tastes good, what to cook at home or what to order at restaurants, check out some of the other links in the description for more information. But changing our personal habits is just the first step. If we're serious about building a better food system where we don't torture and kill billions of sentient land animals and trillions of sentient sea animals every year, it's also going to require legislative reform, resources to help farmers transition away from animal agriculture, and other forms of social and political action. So I've also included some links in the description to specific ways that you can help organizations and campaigns that are working to change the system for the better. Finally, if you think this video is interesting or important, please share it with your family and friends and drop me a comment below to let me know what surprised you the most to learn about chickens and whether this video changed how you feel about them. Thanks for watching and see you next time.